When the world names its great artists the human figure, they name the greats like Leonardo da Vinci. But some of us name Jack Kirby. What do you think of the great figure artists in the Renaissance? Men like Raphael, who created men like gods. Did not Jack Kirby give us men as gods in the Inhumans like Backbolt? What about gods as men by the great Michelangelo? Did not Jack Kirby give us his god as man in the form of Galactus? If Michelangelo, the greatest artist of all time, gave us the Pieta, did Kirby not give us his Pieta with Thor and Odin? If Michelangelo is considered the greatest artist of all time, is not Jack Kirby the greatest comic artist of all time? Have his creations not covered television and movies as well? Ladies and gentlemen, how did Jack Kirby, who came from modest beginnings on the Lower East Side, give us universes of imagination beyond our understanding? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the centennial of Jack Kirby, the king of comics. And my name is Arlen Schumer. Thank you very much. My lecture really comes out of my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, which I have at my table that you can purchase and I'll sign for you afterwards. When you open up the book and you get to the title page, these are the names of the men that I believe are our Renaissance masters of the human figure, in the same way that we look back on those great Renaissance artists 500 years ago. I truly believe that our historians or aliens 500 years from now are gonna look back at these men as our great masters of the human figure, and maybe under the atomic rubble, they'll discover my book, and they'll say, hey, Arlen Schumer knew what was going on, right? So, of course, here's Kirby. He has the longest chapter in my book. Now, why I've chosen the thing out of the multitude of characters Kirby created to be his introductory facial image, I'll go into in a little while. But Ghosted Behind the Type is a self-portrait that Kirby did in 1970 Happened to be, for you inking aficionados out there, the first piece ever inked by Mike Royer, who many consider his greatest inker. But there's Kirby photographed around the same time that image was taken. Here's Kirby as a child, growing up the son of European immigrants, Jewish immigrants, who lived, like millions others did, on the Lower East Side of New York City, Manhattan. Um, now it's a chic, groovy neighborhood for young people, but that was a photograph back at kind of around the turn of the century where there Kirby is drawing what he remembers the Lower East Side in his only, only autobiographical comic story that he did in 1990, or it was published in 1990, four years before he died. And you can just see from this transition how accurate this drawing is to the real Lower East Side. It's a story called Street Code, and if you've never seen it, you should really seek it out, because Kirby really shows you in his sensitive drawings, you know, he's known as the most bombastic superhero artist, and yet some of his greatest drawings are found in this story where you don't even need the dialogue or the words that he later put in to understand the look of love and concern on his mother's face in that middle bottom panel as young Jack Kirby goes out to have those knockdown, drag out fights with all the other kid gangs of the other ethnic um, gangs that each inhabited a block. It was like a Judge Dredd story, you know? But it was all this fighting that Kirby documents on the rooftops, downstairs, in the alleys, that you'll see later is what he used in his Captain America and his fight scenes literally drawn from his own personal experience. But here he is as a late teenager, and what is he doing here? What is he drawing? Because for many artists, getting out of that ghetto was through art. Nothing's really changed much, obviously. He was doing the in-between drawings for the great Max Fleischer Popeye cartoons in the 1930s. So the lead animator would make a drawing like this, and then you see Jack Hertzberg, um, that was Yaakov Kurtzberg, was his real Hebrew derivative name, but before he changed his name, Jack Kirby. So he would do the in-between drawings, and the final animators would do the drawings that you see kind of on television. And there's Popeye eating spinach. Now, 
Interestingly, at the same time these cartoons were being shown in theaters in the mid to late 30s, two young comic artists and writers named Siegel and Schuster were looking at these cartoons and saying, you know, if we can take a cartoony character like Popeye, who gains super strength when he eats spinach, and treat him realistically, like the realistic adventure comic strips Terry and the Pirates and that they were seeing, Flash Gordon, we could have something. And that's where you get Superman. But I digress. Here is the newsstand of 1938 in New York City. And why is this significant? Because in the spring of 1938, if you look down below, you see the first issue of Superman that came out and kicked off a whole revolution in both comic books themselves and in this new idea called the superhero. So other young comic artists like Jaime Simon on the left changed his name to Joe Simon, and there's Yaakov Kurtzberg, now known as Jack Kirby, were like so many other late teenagers, early 20s, breaking into this field of comic books. Comic strips, you had to be older, you had to be not Jewish usually, to work for the newspapers. But many young American New York Jews were able to get into what was considered trash, the comic books. It wasn't like the respected newspaper strips which were read by adults in newspapers. So there they are working on a DC uh, boy group comic, which was a genre they innovated, the boy gang, which you know they got from the movies with the R gang comedies and things like that. But they're doing superhero Superman knockoffs like Red Raven and Blue Bolt. By the way, there's that Boy Commandos cover they did, and that was for the young DC Comics. But as two young American Jews, they were very much aware of what was happening in Europe with the rise of Hitler and the other fascists. And they felt powerless, but they said, what can we, as two creative young Jews, do to help raise the consciousness of America, which if you know your history, was very isolationist in following World War I. They did not want to fight what was called Europe's war, and they certainly were not going to fight a war to save the Jews. So what did two American Jews do? they create the first patriotic superhero, Captain America. And this drawing is actually Joe Simon, who was more of a businessman and a writer and an anchor than he was an artist. So his drawing of Captain America is really a co-creation because starting with the splash page in the first issue, Jack Kirby really becomes the artist associated with Captain America. Here's the cover to that first issue. And this cover of Hidden Punching Hitler has become a pop culture icon. I mean, look, Alex Ross has painted it. Um, if you remember the novel Cavalier and Clay, they paid homage to that when they had their character called the Escapist punching Hitler as well. Now, what's interesting is this comes out seven months before America goes into World War II. Captain America was so successful overnight that they were dressing up actors to stump for war bonds. But what's interesting is, a couple months before this came out, a rival company comes out with The Shield. Now what's interesting is, you know, it was a small community back then. Did Kirby and Simon literally copy The Shield? Well, a couple of legal letters went back and forth. And then we have this sketch by Joe Simon showing how their concession to Harvey Comics, which owned um, The Shield, they would later do, not Harvey, Archie Comics. Uh, they were called, I forget, Magazine Enterprises. Once Archie became famous in the late 40s, they changed their name to Archie Comics, but they owned The Shield. And it seems like the only concession Simon and Kirby made to legally clear up any problems was they changed the triangular shield to a round shield. And that's why starting in issue two, you see the round shield of Captain America that's become literally an icon of Captain America. But Captain America also was probably the first cosplay because look at this photo that we have from right around the time of the second issue. That's how popular Captain America was literally overnight. And in those very first issues, Captain America is pitching the young readers that they should join his group, the Sentinels of Liberty, modeled after the Superman kid group, whatever that was called. But Captain America warning you, what does that tell you? What is Captain America if not the 20th century version of the great 19th and 18th century American heroic icon, Uncle Sam? And God bless the internet because you end up finding pictures like this that are exactly the point I want to make. 
And that's what was great about the first Captain America movie, was that they actually were truthful to what I just mentioned before, that they dressed up in real life actors to suffer war bonds in 1941, before America even entered the war. So they paid homage to that by having him actually do that in the film. One of the first superhero serials was Captain America, and this is the beginning of the kind of goofy, live-action Captain Americas that over the years we'll see. They never really got right until, of course, the recent uh, Chris, uh, what's his last name? Chris Evans. Yes, the Chris Evans movies. But this idea of punching Hitler instantly became copied and popular, and the idea of Captain America, a patriotic superhero representing America, was instantly imitated and copied as well. So you have Captain Battle, Minute Man, and then the idea of fighting a proxy war with the Axis powers on the comic book covers specifically became a mainstay of the young Marvel comics of which Captain America was one of their flagship characters. So you've got the Human Torch and Torchy fighting what were called the Japanazi rats. They're submariner as well. Yes, comics, you know, very racist back then, but all of America was racist and pretty much still is. That's a story for another time. But it was the success of Captain America and the Marvel approach. You later have DC and Superman doing the same thing. So when you see iconic images like this, where Superman is so tied to truth, justice, and the American way, it's really because of the influence of Captain America that made Superman and all the superheroes become so inextricably linked with American ideas and ideals. And Kirby himself was a soldier who went into World War II like a lot of the young comic artists did, and they had their friends who stayed behind kind of ghosts for them. So Kirby ended up fighting for George Patton, and we'll talk about that a little later. But what happened to superheroes when the war ended and they didn't have that proxy war to fight anymore? All of a sudden, you start seeing covers like this of Superman getting domesticated. Batman is not fighting Gotham City criminals. He's fighting aliens on other worlds. And then other genres begin to take over superhero comics. You have the Western in the late 40s is very popular. Just like film noir, crime stories, horror stories start to get told in comics. Formerly lighthearted, even funny comic characters like Captain Marvel and Plastic Man are now fighting grim, grisly villains like this. And it affected Captain America as well because this is the second to last issue from 1949 called Captain America's Weird Tales. And eventually the comic, the next issue, just became Weird Tales. And Captain America, like all the superheroes, disappeared by the early 1950s. So here's a picture of Simon and Kirby back then. And they go off on their own and they decide to try other genres because back then, you tried, since you couldn't rely on the superhero, you had to come up with other genres. And one of the genres they came up with was romance comics. And also, immediately an overnight success. Now, I'm jumping ahead to 1956. Why? Because this is the very first piece of art considered to be pop art. And it was called pop art because, and by the way, that's a collage about 8 half by 11. It's not a painting. The English artist, Richard Hamilton, basically asked his artist friend in New York to send him a bunch of American magazine clippings. And Richard Hamilton ended up putting that collage together. And then a critic saw the giant Tootsie Pop being held by the He-Man in the center and called it pop art. But obviously, when you look on the wall there, what do you see? But this romance comic cover by Jack Kirby and Joe Simon. So right from the beginning, pop art and comic book art are inextricably linked for the rest of time. And we'll talk about that again a little later as we get into the 1960s. But Simon and Kirby are, did a body of work in the 40s and 50s when they worked together that is the sub could be the subject, obviously it's been the subject of books, uh, it's a subject of a whole other lecture. And it's never been my favorite body of work because I was too young, like a whole generation was, to be affected by this work emotionally. 
Um, but a lot of Kirby fans love the Simon Kirby era. They did a lot of westerns because in movies and television in the early 50s, westerns were the most popular genre. So Kirby let his imagination and his drawing ability run wild on double page spreads like this, which you can see the effect of the great western shame in not only other movies and TV show westerns, but in double page spreads like this by Simon and Kirby, if you remember the famous fight scene in the saloon in Shane, maybe the greatest single fight scene in a Western ever, in my opinion, and many of the critics. And if you're a fan of these Westerns, you can get the collected edition of Boys Ranch. But Kirby, like a lot of the artists of the generation, they had to draw anything, any genre that the publishers and editors handed them. So Kirby was a master of all genres, and these are all the collections that you could get now, God bless today's publishing world, where all of these great comics have been collected in one form or the other under all the different genres Simon and Kirby worked under. So science fiction, horror, and yes, they even tried their hand in the 50s when superheroes were dead to try to resuscitate their own Captain America in the form of a character they called Fighting American. Now, the problem I and many other fans have is that it was kind of treated with a humorous tone, kind of pre-camp, pre-Batman TV show. Because look, Fighting American is fighting Poison Ivan and Hotsky Trotsky. Because remember, the villains in the 50s were the communists. But even in these Fighting American comics, you can see the emergence of Kirby's mature style that would hit in the next decade especially in his fight scenes. So remember this page of this nine panel tier design that I'm gonna to refer to later on in this presentation to show you how Kirby's dynamic fighting style developed. So Fighting American wasn't successful, then he goes to Archie Comics that had the shield and Simon and Kirby sell them the idea of resuscitating him as Private Strong who becomes the shield. And this too was a knockoff of Captain America, and like most other superhero revivals other than the one DC does, they all fail. So Simon and Kirby, shown here in one of their last pictures together in the late 50s, decide to split up. Kirby's on his own, and he's got a young family to support, and he needs the work. So he goes to the giant, at the time in the late 50s, DC Comics who he knew was having success with their superhero revivals, like The Flash in 1956, maybe the first pop culture reboot. You know, the word reboot is very popular now, but the first reboot in American pop culture is probably The Flash, because he starts out 15 years, 16 years earlier in 1940 looking like this. All the superheroes that DC resuscitates in what became the Silver Age were basically reboots of their 1940s characters. Now look at the design of the early Green Lantern. The early superheroes were based on strong men in the circus and magicians with their cloaks. But look at the sleek modern design that Gil Kane gives Green Lantern in 1959. So DC Comics was having this new success with superheroes. Jack Kirby goes there and they assign him a backup feature with another green character named Green Arrow. And Kirby does his best with basically mediocre strips. But you know, we look back now and you can get a collection of these Green Arrow stories that laid the foundation for Green Arrow becoming a successful member of the Justice League of America in the 1960s, who eventually, in the hands of Neil Adams, was further rebooted with facial hair, the first superhero with a goatee. Then Adams teams him up in 1969 with Green Lantern for a legendary run. And all of these Green Arrows somehow go into the popular Green Arrow series. But Jack Kirby played a part in the success of this um, property. But you're going to see others in my presentation way more successful than Green Arrow. So he creates a team group called the Challenge the Unknown for DC Comics. And since you know about the Fantastic Four, when you look at the Challenge of the Unknown, who were four globe-trotting daredevils, each one had their specialty, it's Kirby's first attempt at a, quote, Fantastic Four. All of the artistic tropes that Kirby would become famous for in the 60s, 
you can see their early beginnings in the challengers, like his love of what would become known as Kirby Tech. But the real key to the greatness of the challenge of the unknowns is the art, because Kirby's pencils were inked by one of the greatest pure inkers in comic history, the great Wally Wood, who was known, one of his artistic tropes, was the high contrast lighting effect of putting solid black on three quarters of the face and allowing the white highlight. And many Kirby aficionados consider the comic strip they did together after the few issues of Challengers they did called Sky Masters of the Space Force that ran from like 1959 to 61, I think. And when you look at the daily strips stacked up like this, you can see not only the greatness of the early Jack Kirby bursting forth, but obviously the beautiful high contrast chiaroscuro inks of Wally Wood. Even the color Sundays actually look better in black and white because of Wood's incredible inking. I mean, look at the work that Kirby and Wood put into this one daily strip that breaks the kind of conformity of the individual four panels. Kirby must have loved that page so much because he kept the original art of that one strip and there he is in the early 90s holding it for the camera. So things don't work out at DC Comics because he has a falling out with the editor there who sold him the Skymaster strip. It's a whole legal kerfuffle. But pretty much Kirby was blackballed at DC Comics for a decade. And he doesn't return to them until 1970, which we'll talk about in part two of this presentation. So he goes across town to Atlas Comics, which had changed his name from Timely Comics, which would eventually become Marvel Comics. And he gets teamed up with their writer-editor, their only writer and only editor, named Stan Lee, who changed his name from Stan Lee Lieber. Now, here's a picture from them in the mid-60s, but here's what Stan Lee looked like in the early 60s when he was doing a bunch of monster comics that were knockoffs of all of the bad 50s science fiction movies that were out. And this is the kind of crap they gave Kirby to illustrate. And Kirby did his best with it, but, you know, every issue had a wackier name than the other. But across town, they're noticing the success of DC Comics with their Justice League of America, which brought in all of their rebooted superheroes into a group. And according to the urban comic book legend, Martin Goodman, the publisher of Marvel, and Stan Lee's uncle is having a golf game with Harry Leibowitz, the president of DC Comics, who's bragging about the success of Justice League of America. So what does Martin Goodman do? He goes back to the offices and says to his nephew and to Jack Kirby, can you knock off the Fantastic Four? Now, in the ongoing struggle of who created what, Stan Lee versus Jack Kirby, Exhibit A of Team Lee is the synopsis that supposedly Roy Thomas found at a desk in the 1970s, which is supposed to be proof that Stan Lee created the Fantastic Four, because look, he wrote all these notes. But if you're really an astute comic historian and you read between the lines, literally, and know what went on, chances are what probably happened was that Lee typed this up, but only after having a conversation with Kirby, who knew about what DC was doing, understood superheroes, and according to other sources, for a couple of years before 1961, was petitioning Goodman and Lee. We should do superheroes. We still own the Human Torch. We still have the Submariner. Let's do what DC is doing. But based on this one piece of evidence, Stan Lee and his minions claim sole creatorship. But I, like many of those on Team Kirby, will believe until the day we die that Stan Lee did not create a single thing. He never did before he worked with Kirby and never created a thing after. Woo! Yes, and that it is only Jack Kirby who has the forensic comic book evidence of a guy that wrote and created comics and stories for 20 years before this first issue of the FF hit the newsstand. And you can see how much of a knockoff of the Justice League of America cover it was the small characters fighting the big monster villain. Now, you know from the movies that were made in Fantastic Four, nobody's really crazy about the first one. Okay, the second one in 2008 with the Silver Surfer was kind of better. 
Nobody really likes the movie they did two years ago, right? And now there's rumors that they're going to buy Fox and get the rights, and who knows. It's kind of sad that the flagship creation of Marvel Comics, that was the foundation for the whole Marvel Universe, is now not even being published anymore, I don't think, by Marvel or some crazy thing. Anyway, back to the first issue. So there's Kirby putting this four, remember the number four, which he got from Challenge of the Unknown. When you look at panels of the first Kirby story of FF1, you can see incredible parallels from the Skymaster strip. So here they are getting bombarded with cosmic rays. Again, Jack Kirby was an avid reader of science fiction, pulp magazines. He got uh, National Geographic and popular mechanics every night, so, every month. So he knew about cosmic rays. Stan Lee didn't know cosmic rays, just like Stan Lee didn't know Fo Norse mythology when he did four. You got it, Ryan. Anyway, the spaceship crashes, and we start to see the results of the cosmic rays on our four intrepid adventurers. So Ben Grimm becomes the thing. Now, Kirby had already been doing orange rock skin characters at Marvel for a few years before he does the thing. Look, he gives us the two-headed thing. He gives us the thing runs amok. So it's not a stretch to see that when it came time to have the thing in the Fantastic Four, Here's an early pinup. When you, you can see that Kirby's original version was much more lumpy and clay-like. But when I look at this drawing, I think of the classic mythological monster called the Golem. Now, this is a statue of the Golem hanging outside the famous Prague synagogue because the Golem is based on a 17th century Jewish legend that the Jews think actually happened was that Rabbi Love of the Prague ghetto of Jews wanted to create a being that would save the Jews from the pogroms of their surrounding Christian neighbors. So he creates a being made out of clay that he calls the golem. And in Hebrew, I think golem means mud or clay. And by inscribing the Hebrew word emet on his forehead, which means life, it brings this soulless, mindless being to life to help protect the Jews with his super strength. Well, at the beginning of the, of the legend, he does protect the Jews, but because he has no mind or soul, he ends up killing Jews as well. So Rabbi Love has to literally put him down by taking the E eh off of Emet and leaving the word Met, which means death. And according to legend, the golem is still stored up in that synagogue, up in the attic somewhere. And there's a movie called Kafka that the great filmmaker Steven Soderbergh made uh, in the late 90s, and he shoots it in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, and it's really a beautiful film and very evocative of the Golem era. But we know of the Golem in the 20th century because first, a sort of famous silent film in Germany was made in like 1926, and you can see the influence visually this has on the essential golem story of Frankenstein, because it's all about the moral of the story being only God can create life. Whenever man tries to create life, it always gets screwed up. And so Mary Shelley, who writes Frankenstein in the 19th century, by that time the golem myth had been circulating around Europe for 200 years. So the idea of Frankenstein really is the golem myth, and therefore the thing is the goal of myth taken into comics either knowingly or instinctively or collective unconsciously by a Jewish creator like Jack Kirby. So now we see Mr. Fantastic. Boy, what a name, right? Mr. Fantastic. Now only a guy with an ego like Stan Lee, that I think he did create. I don't think Stan Lee, I don't think Jack Kirby would come up with a name like Mr. Fantastic. I mean, you gotta really have an inflated opinion of yourself, right? You're calling yourself Mr. Fantastic. Okay, but I digress. The idea of a super stretching man, of course, we have Plastic Man. Even DC Comics, a year before the FF, comes up with their version of Plastic Man, and God bless DC Comics, only a writer and editor like Julius Schwartz, knowing that the word plastic was taken, would teach an entire generation of children the word elongated. I mean, that really rolls off the tongue, right? Elongated man. But yet, we were all the only eight years old that knew the word elongated. There are adults that don't even know what the word elongated means. 
But comics taught us how to read before we learned how to read. Then we get the Human Torch, who of course is based on the 1940s Human Torch that Marvel owned. But that torch was a robot or an android, and of course our Human Torch is young Johnny Storm, the hot-headed teenager. But you can see again that Kirby was already playing around in those Marvel Monster comics with flame beings. And you can see the relation to the original Human Torch in this early Jack Kirby by Dick Ayer's pinup page. But remember what I told you about the challenge of the unknown? There's a great article in the Jack Kirby Collector, you should find it, all about the parallels between the first dozen issues of FF and the first dozen issues of Challenges of the Unknown. And you will see stories and concepts like this that are directly parallel. So this idea, once again, that Stan Lee created the Fantastic Four and then Jack Kirby drew up Stan Lee's ideas is totally debunked by the existence of these Challenges of the, of the Unknown parallels. The last character, the invisible girl or invisible woman, whatever you want to call her, it was a, a, an idea in the public domain, the invisible man already, and there's Kirby doing a story when he was in DC Comics about that. So there's the final panel of the first issue of the Fantastic Four. Even the look of the thing in that overcoat, Kirby might have gotten from this 1960 horror movie, Hand of Death, with this being that looks exactly like the thing. The vehicle, because it was immediately successful, to launch what became the Marvel Age of Comics by taking, just like DC did, their mothball 1940s characters and rebooting them for this new decade. When you look at the Submariner and you look at that design, you can't help but feel he had to have an impact on the design of this guy. Issue five, Kirby introduces the great Marvel villain, Doctor Doom. This is Kirby early, you know, Doctor Doom, it's not quite the one we're more familiar with, with Kirby's mature style from about five years later, which had to be an influence on a young comic book store owner and budding filmmaker who in the 1970s made this little independent movie, maybe you've heard of it, right? But yes, the parallels, which we'll catch a little later on in this presentation, between Star Wars and Kirby's work are numerous. But it was in these annuals with characters like Doctor Doom that the Marvel Universe takes that evolutionary leap forward. At the same time as this annual in 1963, Kirby gives us another hooded villain that ties into Kirby's Jewish background when you have the hate monger. Now this is based on the early 60s resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan in the South because of the early civil rights movement. But when you read dialogue like this, again, written by Stan Lee, but based on Kirby's drawings, which were done first, like a silent movie, and we'll get into that a little later as well. But this dialogue, this could be right from the Trump campaign of this past year, and that's from 1963. When they finally unmask the hate monger, who is he? Of course, he's Hitler, <laughs> the clone of Hitler. Maybe this influenced the boys of Brazil. Look, the hate ray must have been one of the last achievements, right? But Kirby was unabashedly Jewish. In fact, this is a Hanukkah card that he draws later in life where he's got the thing, you know, with his talus on. And God bless the internet again because you see great images like this. It's Dobbin in time, which is the Hebrew word for prayer. When you Dobbin, you see these old Jewish wise men, they do this, and that's called Dobbin which is based on its clobber in time, right? Kirby's great thing. So remember I told you, why did I use the thing in that face? Because Kirby, when he did the self-portrait sketch, said, for the record, of all the characters I've created and drawn, the thing is most like me. He talks like me, his attitude, he moves like me. And that's why you get, yeah, absolutely right. And there's so many pictures of Kirby drawing the thing. And I even like this self-portrait he did a little later on in his career. That's the best resolution I could find of that image. But the thing becomes the standout popular character of the Fantastic Four, and he's like an anti-hero. He's a monster that we love. So Martin Goodman, who was always about whatever's successful, let's knock it off. And if it's not successful, discontinue it. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So he says to Liam Kirby, can you come up with another 
lovable monster, and they come up with the Hulk. Now, why is the Hulk, well, let's not talk about his greatness first, but just like with the thing, you can see precedence in Kirby's monster work for other Hulks. Now, a lot of people think they created the Hulk based on the Jekyll and Hyde split personality, but once you dig in a little deeper in comic history, you come up with this version of the creation of the Hulk. It comes from, once again, Frankenstein. This is the box cover of the Aurora figure model that was the biggest selling toy of 1960. And Martin Goodman saw the sales reports and said to Kirby and Lee after the success of the thing, can you give me a superhero version of Frankenstein? Another monster that we identified with, that we sympathized with. Now the problem was, the movie wasn't black and white. The box cover was green because somebody at Aurora decided, I don't want a black and white box cover to sell this figure, so somebody decided to make him green. But that's probably what Martin Goodman expected. So when the first issue of The Hulk comes out, and here's the house ad, and Martin Goodman sees the gray Hulk, which according to Stan Lee, he said, you know, I chose the color gray when I sent the book to the printer because I thought gray was spooky for monsters. But I bet you Martin Goodman saw this and said to Lee, where is my green superhero version of Frankenstein? And that's why starting with issue two, you get the green Hulk that we know and love that's become a star in Marvel Comics from solo movies to where he's become a star even of the Avengers to the point where with the last Avengers film they put the Hulk on the cover. And then of course you get Thor, the new Ragnarok movie is out now. He's been around since 2011 with the first movie. And when you look at Thor, another Kirby creation, he starts out in 1962 after the Hulk is created as the next great Marvel superhero. But he's kind of, he's supposed to be Marvel's Superman. That's why he's got the red, yellow, and blue color scheme. And you can see in his very first drawing, he's not the big, muscular, bulky Thor of Kirby's later, more mature period of drawing. But Thor was a mythological character that Kirby had read stories about, and his parents told him stories of the North legends that were passed down to them from Europe. But in the early comic book field, Thor was a public domain character. And sometimes he was a good god of thunder, and sometimes even Kirby himself, with Simon at DC Comics in the early 40s, used Thor as a villain. DC Comics in the 1950s had Thor as a villain, not as a good god. Over at DC Comics, you had Joe Kubert with his version of a kind of a medieval warrior, the Hammer of um, Viking Prince, has a story where he's fighting the Hammer of Thor. Kirby himself at DC Comics in the late 50s does this story of the Magic Hammer, and it's similar to the story of young Don Blake, the lame doctor, finding the hammer of Thor and using it. So once again, this idea that Stan Lee creates Thor and gives it to Jack Kirby to draw up, which is the official creation story supported by Marvel and Disney, is belied by all of this early Kirby work that shows him playing with the name Thor, spelled different ways. So after all of this Thor background, we finally get the 1962 Thor. And there's Don Blake and what have become the kind of stations of the cross of all of these comic characters where we know the origins by heart and how he gets the power of Thor after striking the cane. And over the next year or two, you begin to see Kirby's art in 1963 and 64 begin to achieve that mature Kirby look that we all have come to know and love, the bulkier, a muscular look. In 64, he starts getting inked by a great inker named Chick Stone, who times his appearance with Kirby just as Kirby is hitting his artistic stride. But really what begins to elevate Thor to the next level is when Kirby really starts to forget about him being the Superman of Marvel Comics and makes him come into his own by giving him the whole North mythological base via these stories set not on Earth, but in Asgard. And Kirby's style develops at the same time. So here's a cover from 1966 in the beginning of his peak period in Marvel Comics, 
when you strip it away to its black and white original, you can see the biblical and mythological influences of a character like Samson. Or maybe Kirby was influenced by the movies that were around then that were called the sword and sandal epic. So here's Victor Mature as Samson. Even Kirby's Hercules, which he debuts in 1965, was he influenced by mythological versions of Hercules? Or was he influenced by the Steve Reeves Hercules movies that were around at the time and had their comic book knockoff spin-offs? I mean, look at how Kurt Swan over at DC handled Superman with Hercules. We love Kurt Swan, no offense to Kurt Swan, but it's nothing like what Kirby was bringing to superhero musculature with his Thor work. I mean, muscles like you see on Hercules' left arm don't exist in nature, but in Kirby's world of stylization, it does exist and it looks right and it looks perfect. Great artists like Walt Simon said have paid homage to that image. Then you get Kirby's Pieta, one of his greatest single images that I have no problem comparing to Michelangelo's Pieta. And that brings us to Odin where Kirby gets to really strut his stuff with all that regal headdress and wear. And you can see that the new movies have kind of tried to pay homage to Kirby's pageantry. I mean, there's their version of Asgard. Not bad. I kind of will always wish they had done more the original floating Asgard in the middle of outer space like that. But again, you know, they do their best. The Asgard, the Rainbow Bridge in the movies, not bad. But the problem I have with the cinematic Thor, where's the helmet? Because without the helmet, even when Kirby drew him, he looked like a hippie from the 60s. You need that helmet. That's part of what makes these characters visual icons. The helmet is part of Thor. So what made Thor and all the Marvel characters click with audiences in the 60s, especially the counterculture, was that at the same time these characters would have otherworldly alien battles they also fought in the real world and were really the first superheroes to, remember the World War II heroes were fighting that proxy war in World War II? So in the 60s, it's the Marvel Comics characters that are first going to Vietnam in a kind of proxy way. In addition, because they were counterculture super anti-heroes, the counterculture adopts them. So here's the first Ken Kesey acid test poster when LSD was still legal in January of 1966. And when you look closely, of course, in the center, what do you see but Jack Kirby's Thor? If you read Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, the greatest novel about the psychedelic beginnings of the 60s, he talks about how the Merry Prankster's bus was festooned with images of Marvel Comics characters like Thor. Look at the psychedelic poster that they produced in the late 60s for black and white. Um, you know, black light posters. But you know, the actual original from the comic books shown here is just the psychedelic. You don't need psychedelic colors to make that psychedelic, and that's why comic book art in the 60s was more psychedelic than the actual psychedelic art that came a little after. Another great character he creates for Thor is Hela, the goddess of death which if you've seen Ragnarok already, this is production art for it. And here's how Kate Blanchett ended up looking like in the movie. They did a pretty good version of translating Hell, I think. In the movie, Kate Blanchett, of course, is great. And here's one of Kirby's last Thor covers, and you can see how Kirby's mature style, what a difference, like, eight years makes, right? Now, the same month this issue of Thor debuts, the other great Marvel Comics character that had a touch of Kirby, or perhaps more than a touch of Kirby, the first issue of Spider-Man, which was the last issue of Amazing Fantasy, an anthology title, in 1962, features a cover penciled by Kirby and inked by the actual co-creator of this version of Spider-Man named Steve Ditko. Now, the interesting thing about Spider-Man is that he was banded about for 10 years before Ditko put pencil and paper and came up with that costume. Because Simon and Kirby, when they were still together in the early 50s, tried to sell a superhero that they called Spider-Man. Except their Spider-Man 
later called a silver spider in this presentation piece, was a young kid like Peter Parker, and he discovers a magic ring or something, and it turns him into the silver spider. So there are some elements. I think he also lived with his uncle and aunt or something like that. For this presentation piece, they hired the artist of Captain Marvel, who had a similar Billy Batson, the young kid who becomes the adult Captain Marvel. So nothing ever came of this. Then in the late 50s, when Kirby is split from Simon, he comes up with a pitch for this character, Night Fighter, that never gets past these two proposal covers. Or maybe this is when he was still with Simon, I think. But you can see the idea of a character that could walk on walls with the suction cups is an element that would make it into the eventual Spider-Man. And the character they did come up with that was like Night Fighter was the fly, who, like the spider, he could fly like a fly, but he also could kind of walk on walls and things like that. He even had a villain named Spider Spry, so the fly and the spider. But once Kirby drew a couple of pages of this new Spider-Man to pitch to Stan Lee, based on some of these earlier proposals, Steve Ditko took a look at, Stan, at Jack Kirby's drawings and said to Stan Lee, he's a little too close to the fly. Now, Steve Ditko made this drawing in 1990 to tell people what he was talking about. If you look at his version of Captain America, and according to Ditko's memory, this is what those early drawings of supposedly eight pages or so of Kirby's Spider-Man from 1962. And you can see, according to Ditko, not only does it look like Captain America, but it does look like that Night Fighter and or the Fly. And Ditko's whole point is that until an artist comes up with a unique creation, you do not have a character. This is not Spider-Man. That is Spider-Man. That is what became successful. Now, Stanley's story goes, well, I gave the page to Kirby, but he gave me a character that was too bulky and too Kirby-like, so I decided to give the pages to Ditko because I wanted more of an every man, blah, 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 blah. The real truth is probably what Ditko told us, is that Stan Lee, to avoid getting sued by Archie Comics and The Fly, took the pages out from Kirby and gave them to Ditko and said, okay, Steve, you know what's going on. Give me your version of Spider-Man. But then the irony, of course, if you believe Stanley's story, then why would he not allow Ditko and his version of the first cover to be published? Why did he then give it to Jack Kirby to re-pencil and let Ditko ink it? So this idea that while I didn't want the superheroic Kirby is belied by the fact that he let Kirby do the first cover because he thought it would sell better. That is why, as a forensic comic book detective, you cannot believe anything Stanley says because it's proven wrong by the actual comic book evidence. But this is why, till his dying day, Kirby still claimed he co-created Spider-Man because he felt that everything he had done prior led up to Spider-Man getting published by Marvel Comics. He also penciled the first issue of Spider-Man in his own title in 1963, again inked by Ditko, that gives credence to Team Kirby's claims that Jack Kirby did have a hand in creating Spider-Man. Now the same month that issue came out, you get the first issue of the next great Marvel superhero, Iron Man, that Kirby creates probably did the layouts and the basic design, and then lesser artists at Marvel, like Don Heck, would then draw the interiors. But if you've seen the original Captain America, uh, Iron Man movie uh, in 08 with Robert Downey, they paid homage to the bulky Iron Man from the very first origin story. So you see it says art by Don Heck, probably over Kirby layouts. But Iron Man becomes not only one of the kind of great B Marvel characters, he only became a grade A character when Robert Downey played him, but he was always kind of on the second tier, yet very influential as a character, because if you look at one of the first anime manga superheroes, Tobor the Eighth Man, his story is pretty much like the Iron Man story. He's a cop who gets almost killed, and he has to restore himself, so as a robot he gets rebuilt, and blah, 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 blah. It's pretty much Iron Man, 
it also is pretty much RoboCop as well. I mean, RoboCop is a direct steal, more of the Eighth Man than of Iron Man, but you can still see the influence of Kirby's Iron Man, and I love this ad by um, Altoid Mints, right? It shows you that Iron Man's become a pop icon himself. So here's an early Marvel Comics house ad drawn by Kirby that shows you the nation early Marvel superheroes. Now, who is that little insect-like character? Well, that's the Ant-Man, who appears in 1962 in a story without a costume. He's just the man in the anthill, a scientist who gets shrunk down. Now, over at DC Comics, they were having success with their superhero who could shrink down to microscopic size, the Atom. So with the success of the Atom, and again, nobody knows for sure whether Kirby was aware of the Atom over DC, but again, the New York comic world was a small world. But that's why six months after Adam's first issue, you get the superhero, the Atom, in a similar red and bluish color scheme. And now because of the success in the movies, back issues of the Ant-Man, who was a grade D Marvel character, have now shot up to grade A sales. So just like with the Justice League of America, they pull all of the early Marvel superheroes together into their first team book, The Avengers in 1963. Obviously, we know the Avengers have become multi-billion dollar successful film property. But here's the last panel of the very first Avengers story, which appeared at the same time this story appeared in American history. And this so affected Jack Kirby who, like many people, loved President Kennedy and felt such a sense of loss that he said, basically, to Marvel Comics, we have to bring back Captain America. We need him to kind of take the place of our American hero who just got murdered, John Kennedy. Now, they tried to bring back Captain America in 1955, not with Kirby, obviously. Actually, that's the future Spider-Man artist, John Romita, doing Captain America. But if you notice, he's a commie smasher, and only three issues came and went. Possibly, if you remember The Flash, when he was rebooted, he had a different costume. A year before, they tried to reboot Captain America, but with the same costume. Maybe that's why it wasn't successful. Nobody knows for sure, because The Flash was what was so successful with the changed costume. But in late 63, they kind of float a couple of trial balloons with Captain America to see how the early Marvel Comics fans would react. And the fan mail was immediately overwhelming, saying, yes, bring Captain America back. So then they put him in the World War II version of uh, DC Sergeant Rock, which is Jack Kirby Sergeant Fury, and this is successful. So in the spring of 64, Captain America is brought back for real in the pages of the Avengers. And this cover, although poorly inked by one of the worst thinkers in comics history, George Russo, we can discuss that at my table later if you feel differently, but that cover has become a visual icon in comics history. That's the great Alex Ross. And Captain America, just like in 1941, is immediately successful in 1964 to the point where Marvel gives him a backup series in the Iron Man title. And this is where Kirby begins to really strut his stuff as an action figure superhero fight artist. And while the thing was the character that was most like him, Kirby goes on record as saying that Captain America is the character he most liked to draw, and it was because of the movement and the action. This very first story, he's literally leaping off the page and aided by the kind of magic marker, bold contour outlines of the Inker Chick Stone, his mature style in the 60s emerges in these late 1964 Captain America backups. You can feel the energy and tension in that figure because so much of what art is about, the history of art, is about tension and release. And you can see that in Kirby's Captain America where with the aid of a cartoonist, astute use of motion lines, action lines, that tell you that he's straining at his bonds. And then you turn the page and you're hit with this panel where you can feel the release of that energy. 
Now remember I told you, all of these fight scenes are all out of Kirby's imagination from the fights he was having on the Lower East Side with these kid gangs. They were using garbage can covers as shields, and Kirby was probably kicked like this by some older kid in the tenements. But once again, look at the power of action lines and motion lines. You young cartoonists out there, of which I can see are plentiful, should learn the power of motion lines to give your pictures energy. Because look at what was happening in the competition. Look at Gil Kane, the great Green Lantern artist in DC. At the same time Kirby's doing what he's doing at Marvel, Kane is trying to incorporate Kirby's dynamism into his own work. Coincidentally or ironically, he goes to Marvel a year later in 1967 and does a Captain America story where he gets to actually do those same kind of poses. Now when you look at a Kirby typical Captain America action panel like that, and if you came to my Batman animated lecture earlier today, you can see the influence that Kirby's had on a generation of comic artists like Bruce Timm, who incorporated some of that energy and power. Now remember I told you to remember this fighting American nine panel gridded fight scene? A decade later, you can see Kirby's mature artistic style emerge in this classic nine panel fight sequence of Kirby in his mid-60s Marvel Comics Prime. But in 1965, a year after he comes back, he's so popular that he becomes the de facto, or the real, excuse me, leader of the Avengers. And like Thor, he also goes to Vietnam to fight. Again, we love those trick stone bold inks. But this is why when you get to 1969 and you see Easy Rider and Peter Fonda as the character Captain America, it's because of what Kirby did with him four and five years earlier that gives him the pop culture cachet to make him so much a part of the counterculture. And here's another psychedelic poster that to me is not any improvement over the original comic book panel that has that psychedelic energy built into it. Now here's Kirby's one of his iconic, again, not my favorite inker, Sid Shores, but talk to me about Sid Shores at the table. And there's Captain America now with Chris Evans as one of the successful Marvel franchises and pretty much the leader of the Avengers, even though as an actor, Robert Downey is more famous. It's Chris Evans who is the leader of the Avengers. That brings us to their other successful Marvel film property, the X-Men which is the next great creation in 1963 after Iron Man. Here's the first issue. And there's Magneto, which was supposed to be the Doctor Doom of the X-Men. But once again, Kirby has Magneto forerunners at Marvel Comics, like this version. Now when you look at Magneto's mask designed by Kirby, you can see that the movies were pretty faithful. And when you look at this image of Magneto, and you know your fine art, you would recognize it as one of the major influences on one of Roy Lichtenstein's most well-known images, ironically titled, The Image Duplicator. Now, because of panels like this, in 1965, the peak of early pop art, that Martin Goodman and Stan Lee said, let's jump on the pop art bandwagon. So for about four months, they decided to call their comic books Pop Art Productions. And that's not the only time Magneto entered the real world, because in 1974, Paul McCartney and Wings titled one of their singles from Venus and Mars album, Magneto and Titanium Man. Here's a shot of them in concert. There's Linda McCartney on the far right, Paul slightly below her. McCartney was a big Kirby fan. Here he is backstage giving Kirby a cake to thank him for all the comics that McCartney read growing up. And here's the drawing that Kirby did of Magneto and Paul and Linda that was based on a promotional film that McCartney did to promote the Venus and Mars album. I love this picture of McCartney looking almost, you know, shy to meet one of his heroes. And of course, probably Kirby had no idea like where he even was at the time, right? But all the Beatles read comics. Here's a famous shot of them. And Lennon McCartney revolutionized comics and superheroes in the 60s with what they did at Marvel, similar to how, I mean, 
Lenny McCartney revolutionized rock and roll, similar to how Lee and Kirby recognized revolutionized superheroes in the 60s. So when you see an image like this of the famous Meet the Beatles album cover from 1964, the reason why I'm showing you this is three years before this album cover appeared, FF1 appeared, but Fantastic Four wasn't its original name. The original group name that Lee gave them was the Fabulous Four. Now, this was before the name Fabulous became Fabulous, but Martin Goodman thought Fabulous was a little fey, and he said to Lee, change it. Now, if Martin Goodman had not butted his head in, they would have been the first Fab Four three years before the Beatles. So in my book, I kind of lay out what I just told you in the text there in the spread. So here's Kirby in about 1964-65, at the time that the early Marvel Revolution is just beginning to blossom. And Kirby's art begins to blossom. Here is a Submariner image from 1963. Only a year later, look at how Kirby's mature art style, again, inked by Chick Stone, but notice the use of photographic collage, which artists hadn't done in comics. You'd have to go back almost 20 years to what Will Eisner and Harvey Kurtzman were doing. But Kirby is really the first one to reintroduce photography as collage in mainstream superhero comics in the 60s. A year later, in 65, he does this annual cover, and only an artist of the magnitude of Kirby could have possibly attempted a drawing like this to include every character he had created at Marvel Comics on a single cover, to the point where all of his designs became the logos of Marvel Comics in the corners of the covers. The merchandise that Martin Goodman starts to put out in 64 and 65 is all based on Kirby designs. Stationary with Kirby designs. That figure is also a figure that was used in the very first mainstream New York media article about Marvel Comics and their early success in 1966, the same week that the TV show debuted. So the New York Herald Tribune, now defunct, decided to devote a special issue of their magazine to all this new interest. Remember pop art productions and comics. And it's the Batmania revolution in 1966 with the flood of material that made Kirby and Marvel sit up and say, what are we going to do to stave off this from the competition? And that's why in 1966, you get the first entrance of the Marvel characters into another medium via animation. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is 4.15. Uh, do you want to take a little break? Because I have now part two. Do you feel the need to stretch your legs or go to the bathroom? If not, I can continue on. So I'm going to throw it out to you, my loving audience. What would you like to do? Break or continue? Continue? Yes. Is everybody okay? Then I will continue. Okay, folks, now let me see if my linking works. If it doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't work. Okay, here we go. Part two, folks. Hold on. I had a hyperlink put in, but as usual, tech fails me. Okay, here we go. Now, you know, they did sort of arrive in September of 66, and they actually hired Kirby to do the design of the illustration. 
Now, a lot of Kirby's most famous characters from Marvel are not in there because Kirby hadn't created them by the time he had to do this illustration. Chief among them is the Inhumans that appear in this issue of the Fantastic Four in late 1965. Here they are a couple years later in um, their own series in 1968 or 69, right before Kirby leaves Marvel. Here's the latest TV version of the Inhumans. Once again, I'm angry that none of them are wearing the masks that Kirby designed for them. And to me, if you're a superhero and you have a mask and they do a live action version and you don't have the mask, I'm sorry. You don't have the superheroes. Now, this was a spinoff of the TV show Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., also created by Kirby with a boost from Saranko. And how did that get created? You'd have to go back to the James Bond craze of the mid-60s and how there were spy movies and spy merchandise. So the comic companies like DC Comics decided to knock off uh, James Bond. And of course, DC came up with a goofy approach. Well, Marvel had a different approach. Kirby said, I'm going to take my World War II character, Sergeant Fury, shown here, which was his knockoff of the DC character, Sergeant Rock by Joe Kubert, and let's bring him again, let's reboot him, and bring him into the 60s as a secret agent. And that's what they did. So in the pages of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., we begin to see some of the Kirby designs, like the giant helicarrier, that the films have tried to do their versions of. They're never as spectacular as Kirby's designs. This looks like just an aircraft character, a carrier floating in space. Now, what is significant about this issue of Doctor Strange teamed up with, you know, it was in a group title. But what's interesting about this cover by Kirby is when you look at the credits, you see the inker with an odd name, Steranko. Now, what was Steranko about? Well, if you look at the energy of that Kirby panel that I showed you before like this, a guy like Steranko was influenced by Kirby, but what he did was he took Kirby and gave him back to us kind of on steroids. So whenever Kirby did, Steranko did one level above. And Steranko was as much a fan of Kirby's as he was, in a sense, almost his competitor. But here he is, drawing Captain America at a comic convention with his hero, Jack Kirby. And anything Steranko would later do, like his psychedelic Nick Fury stories, you can find the seeds of it in Kirby's kind of pre-psychedelic and inherently psychedelic work. And again, this took place in the page of Fantastic Four. So after he introduced the humans, and again, these were all things that Kirby creates in the specter of the Batman TV show helping DC dominate sales. This is Kirby the competitor saying, I've got to create things that will excite readers more than the Batman TV show. So in the next couple of issues, he produces what many consider his greatest works. And it begins with this character, the Watcher, who is heralding the coming of a great villain named Galactus. Now this character, the Watcher, we can see had precedence in other comic stories, not by Kirby. You can see this Watcher, this is from the Charlton comics, I think from the late 50s. And then in Prince Valiant in the 1940s, he had a character, the Watcher, you can see up above there, watching Prince Valiant. And if you know your biblical history, you'll know that the Watchers are steeped in Jewish and Christian biblical history as kind of godlike onlooker angels of the human condition. And that winds its way in Kirby's version of the Watcher. And he heralds the coming of Galactus, who we see in the final page of that issue, looking like this. Now, whoever came up with the kind of Christmas color scheme, it was obviously frowned upon because in the very next issue, we see Galactus in his next iteration with purple and brown. Again, who decided purple and brown? I don't know. But later on, that would change as well, in addition to having the kind of Green Bay Packer G logo in the center of his regal outfit there. Strip away the inking and you get Kirby's beautiful raw pencils of this full page in the Fantastic Four. And you can see it a few years later that Kirby would give the Watcher 
and maybe my single favorite Kirby pencil drawing that was never inked at the time Kirby did it. But it shows you the Watcher kind of done to the same galactic level as Galactus himself. But in the next issue of what would be this trilogy of stories of the Watcher and then Galactus comes the third character. And is it what we think it is? Is it a guy flying on a surfboard in outer space? Yes, Kirby was influenced by the first great surfer movie that came out in 1964 called Endless Summer. And back then in the 60s, culture would develop in California, and then it would take a few years before it kind of migrated to the East Coast. So look at Kirby's first attempt. Look at the bulkiness of that surfboard. Now, remember I told you, he drew out his stories like silent films on paper with margin notes. And when Stan Lee was handed that page, not the exact page shown here, but from the similar time frame, Kirby hadn't named the character. So perhaps Stan Lee's only contribution to Kirby's oeuvre of work is that he named the Silver Surfer. But notice what Stan Lee writes, for want of a better name. I mean, are you kidding me? It's because Stan Lee is the editor that he doesn't have an editor over him saying, Stan, that's a horrible line. Can you just change that? But yes, so Stan Lee named him the Silver Surfer. Not a great leap of imagination, because Stan Lee, all of his names were alliterative. Reed Richards, Peter Parker, right? Pepper Potts, Silver Surfer. Everything with Stan Lee was alliterative like that. That was his shtick. But... What is the Silver Surfer? If Galactus was his idea of God, which he said in interviews, and if you get my book, he talks about that further, but the Surfer is the fallen angel. And that ends up being the theme of the final issue of this incredible trilogy. Now, I want you to focus on the credit box, the right there, and the inker who became known as probably Kirby's greatest inker. I'm one of the many who believe Joe Sinnott is. But look at the faces that sit it inked here. And now as I dissolve slowly to Kirby's pencil faces, you can see what many people who criticize Sinnott as his greatest inker say that they don't like the way he changed Kirby's faces. And you can see suddenly the difference. Look at Reed Richards and Johnny Storm's faces in pencil, and look at what happens when Sinnott inks. He adds a little too much Sinnott. Now, over the years, he would eventually lessen this quality. But what's more important about these credits is that look at what they say. Written by Stan Lee, which to the layman or the comic fan usually means created by. In layman's terms, written usually means it came first. It's on top of the artist. And all Jack Kirby is credited as, as the illustrator. So that already plants the idea in the court of public opinion that Stan Lee wrote the story first, unlike the truth, which was Kirby drawing it out as a silent film on paper first. But this is the problem that will end up haunting Kirby for the rest of his career. Now, a couple of years later, in the late 60s, Stan Lee was magnanimous enough to just say this was created by Stan and Kirby. But again, Stan Lee always put his name first. But think about music. The lyricist is always listed first before the writer of the music. And yet, you're listening to a piece of music. You're not reading a piece of poetry. And yet, in our society, the writer is elevated above the artist. We artists are just idiots who have no people skills, who can make pretty pictures in our basements. But writers are masters of words. If you've worked for an ad agency like I did as an art director, you know that the agency people who were the business people, the money people, who had to mingle with the money people of the clients, they appreciated copywriters because they were masters of words. They didn't respect the artists as much as the copywriters because we were just dumb idiots that could draw pretty pictures. Even in the comics themselves, Lee would voice this lie upon the readers that the Mary Marvel bullpen was this happy place where Stan would dictate ideas to Jack Kirby sitting there like a robot artist drawing up these ideas. The reality, Kirby's in a basement in Long Island at that drawing board, which should be in the Smithsonian, 
And this picture is actually, to tell you the truth, in California when he moved. But essentially, that could have been a basement in Long Island where these masterpieces were created. Modern artists illustrate pictures like this to continue the fiction that Stan Lee was working up at the Marvel offices. And it's true, Stan Lee would pop in every now and then and make corrections and do things while he was in the office. But, like everything else Stan Lee has told you, that is a myth. But here's a picture of Kirby in late 65, early 66, proud of his creations on the wall. And here's a picture of Stan Lee at the same time, proud of what he thinks he created on the wall. So I ended up in 2011, after a recent court case, proclaim Lee as the sole creator because he was working for the company, while Jack Kirby was just a freelancer. So the courts awarded Stan Lee co co sole creator. So I took that image and I created an illustrated manifesto, 16 pages long, that I called the Auteur Theory of Comics, that I based on the famous French critics film theories from the 1950s, the author theory of film, which posited that great commercial entertainment directors like Alfred Hitchcock, who did not write his own screenplays, was nevertheless the author of the film, the auteur in French, because they figured a screenplay is words on paper. And they might be great words, but until the director figures out how to make a movie out of those words, how to cast the right actors, how to block a scene, how to choose a cinematographer, how to make a movie, you do not have a movie. Unfortunately, comics are 75 years behind film theory where fans out there, and maybe in here, somehow think just because the writer might have written the script before he hands it to the artist, doesn't mean that until an artist figures out how to draw that on paper, you don't have a comic book. So on these double-page spreads, that's uh, Francois Truffaut, one of those French film critics, morphing into Jack Kirby to make my statement that I'm trying to make, is that Kirby and all the great comic artists should be considered like the film directors. That's what Kirby hands in to Stan Lee. An entire story, like a silent movie on paper, with margin notes explaining to Lee what the dialogue would be, and then Lee would come in later with the letterer and letter the dialogue based on Kirby's notes. But according to Lee, it was like filling in a crossword puzzle. And yet, in the courts, in the court of public opinion, Lee claims because he wrote the dialogue, that means he wrote the story, which means he created the characters in the story. And unfortunately, the courts and fans and pros alike have bought Stanley's story. People like me that are on Team Kirby, we don't buy Stanley's story, and we never will. The real problem comes in 1974 when Lee writes text introductions to this infamous book, The Origins of Marvel Comics, that reprint all the Foundation origin stories that Stanley claims in his text introductions that he wrote and created first and then got his great artists like Jack Kirby to then draw up these ideas. And even the cover, painted by company man John Romita, shows you in an image where these characters came from. Stan Lee's fingertips. Remember that synopsis from FF1? This is the end result of that lie, that this cover image tells the reader that these characters came off of Stan Lee's typewriter. I prefer to believe that they came off Jack Kirby's drawing board. When I saw images like this created in the early 70s that paint the picture of Lee as the creator of the Marvel Comics characters, that literally blend him in with the characters, it makes me sick. This is current merchandise. This isn't from the 60s or the 70s. You can buy this right now. Here's a new book that just came out. Stan Lee, the man behind Marvel. I look at this picture and all I think of is this. The big lie. It's Orwellian to think that they could put a Stan Lee imitator. That's not Stan Lee. That's a guy posing as Stan Lee. And yet they use that picture. This is a current promotion. This isn't 10 years, 20 years ago. This is now. 
Stan Lee, creator of the Marvel Universe. When you look at one of the great 60s promotional concepts, Make Mine Marvel, I prefer what I saw on the internet, Keep Mine Kirby. Now, when you look at this energy field of what became known as Kirby Dots, where did Kirby get that from? Remember I told you he was a reader of Popular Mechanics, National Geographic? This is a 1965 photograph of the first quasar out in outer space. Now, if you know your pop culture, I think Motorola had a television that they called the quasar. But Kirby must have seen this picture, and he loved the idea of energy as dots. And in one of the very first examples of what became known as Kirby Crackle, in this great image of Galactus from that FF trilogy in 1966, we see the first little inklings of what became known as Kirby Crackle. Only one year later, when he brings Dr. Doom into the Fantastic Four to drain the Silver Surfer of his power, do we really see the debut of what I would call mature Kirby Crackle. And this particular image, I do a lecture on the relationship between fine art and comic art. I maintain this is the greatest single image in the history of not just comic art, but in all of art to portray victory and defeat in a single image. And you would have to really search far and wide in the fine art world to find anything that shows victory and defeat in a single image as great as this Kirby image. Later in 67, um, in that um, second trilogy with Dr. Doom, Kirby gives us the greatest example of Kirby destruction in a single image by showing us the power of Black Bolt, who was silent because his voice was his power, that if he spoke a word, it would let loose a sonic boom that would destroy everything like an atomic bomb. But in that story, in this silent triptych of panels, Kirby builds up the silent scream of the Black Bolt, and then when you turn the page, you're hit with this incredible image of destruction. Now, at the same time Kirby was a master of destruction, he's a master of creation. With these Kirby machineries, that could not possibly exist in real life. That's like a Mobius strip. And yet in Kirby's world, it's so convincing that it does. But when you go back to this image and you strip it of its color, an art teacher named Andre Molishu has posted many examples of fine art comparisons where he looks at the abstract expressionism of a Franz Klein and compares it to the abstract energy of Kirby. When I look at this image of destruction, I think back to that street code image of the crumbling tenements and the density that Kirby literally drew from when he drew that image of destruction. And yet at the same time, the same artist could create these images of high-tech creation. I mean, look at this painting that exists looking like that in reality. I look at that image, it reminds me of the famous surrealist image by Magritte called The Human Condition from 1931. I mean, look at that relationship between the natural world and Kirby's imagination. It can't get any more abstract or direct than that. And in this end paper for one of Kirby's sketchbooks, you can see that similar imagination of technology kind of existing in its own world by its own rules. But the compartmentalizing, I compare to Louise Nevelson and the three-dimensional box sculptures that they created. You can see relationship between the way Kirby organized his Kirby tech spaces. Kirby was ahead of his time with computer imagery because when you look at computer circuits and you see what Kirby was doing before the computer, it's similar. And by the way, that's a beautiful little gif that the internet gifts us with. They only exist for a second, but pretty cool, right? Anyway, that year, 1966, Kirby also gives us, after the Inhumans and Galactus and Silver Surfer, he gives us the negative zone, which was made up of these incredible photo collages that he does. You can see Reed Richards floating there behind this great high-tech computer screen that Kirby gives us. 
But those epics were then contrasted by a very small, quiet story that follows that incredible trilogy that many people, consensus tells us, feel is the greatest single story of Kirby's entire Marvel run, maybe the single greatest story in the Marvel Comics universe. Why? Well, first of all, not only a great cover, but one of the great splash pages, literally splash because of the rain coming down. This image has become iconic. Other great artists like Michael Diodato have done their homages to that. It's all about a villain who hates Reed Richards and Ben Grimm, and he wants to kind of get his revenge, and it's a whole story, but basically he transforms himself into the thing, and he figures he will infiltrate the Fantastic Four's lair of the Baxter building and murder them all because they all think he's the thing. Well, meanwhile, Reed Richards is trapped in the negative zone, and the fake Ben Grimm, who the rest of the FF doesn't know is really a villain, is moved by Reed Richards' sacrifice and the willingness of the other FF members out of their love for him, and it actually changes him. And you can see Kirby's, even in, with the rocky exterior of the thing, he's able to get human emotions across. And if you read the dialogue and look at the expression on the thing, it really rings true. And that's the mark of Kirby, the great artist, that he can wring emotion out of a rocky, textured face. So he goes into the negative zone and takes Reed Richards, who doesn't know that he's the villain. He thinks it's Ben Grimm. Sacrifice himself by throwing Reed Richards out of the negative zone and sacrificing himself. And once again, you can see the emotion, the resignation on this villain's face. And to give Stanley credit, some nice dialogue at the end in this final two page sequence that makes it one of the most memorable stories of Kirby's career and of the Marvel era. But again, you look at the credits. Oh, Stan Lee wrote that, and Jack Kirby only penciled it. And that is evidence, that's exhibit A of what I call the art crime of the 20th century. That Stan Lee stole the creations of Jack Kirby, has had made a very good living off of it, and deprived the Kirby family of literally hundreds of millions of dollars in lost revenue because Kirby created these characters and not Stan Lee. But Kirby at the time had to put food on the table, so he kept creating in 1966 and kept giving Marvel Comics these evergreen characters. Now the Black Panther starts out as a villain. There he is on the first issue. Now there were other Black Panthers in comic history. Look closely at the credits, you can see there's a White Panther in this 1940 jungle comic. They were all spin-offs of Tarzan. Now there's an Australian superhero in the 50s called the Panther. Now look at his costume. That's pretty much exactly like the Black Panther, except it's got the exposed face. Tarzan had a character called the Panther that looked like that. And even Marvel, right before Kirby's Black Panther, is floating this character called the Panther with a fully masked face. Now, after this appears, drawn by Dick Ayers, who used to ink Kirby, you get this first issue appearing, what is that, in July. That means it came out in the spring of 66. Except this cover was not the original cover for that issue. This was. And what is majorly different? He's half exposed as a black man. And this cover was not used because they were afraid that Southern distributors in 1966, during the peak years of the Civil Rights Movement, would not cotton to a black exposed superhero. And that is why when he makes his published appearance, he's fully masked. When he takes off his mask, of course, he's a black African prince. He's not an American superhero. And there is Kirby's drawing of his father, the great African prince of T'Challa, and the kind of African community. Now, Kirby might have known his history because the ancient king of Mali, an African nation in Central Africa, in the 13th century was led by a king that they called the Black Moses, named Masu Mansa. And he had a secret cache of gold that made Mali, which was the home of the great center called Timbuktu, which we've all heard of. 
So there's a lot of resemblances between T'Challa's father and Masu Mansa from the 13th century. Now the words that the young T'Challa uses, I live with but one thought, one aim, one goal, that this should be avenged. Whether Kirby or Stan Lee wrote the dialogue was aware of the great early 20th century black African nationalist Marcus Garvey, who would dress up in flamboyant military costumes like this, but he's the father of the term African American, and he was a role model for Martin Luther King and the civil rights leaders of the later part of the century. But take a look at Jack Kirby's initial drawing for what became the Black Panther. What you notice most about this character, created in 1965, called the Cole type, or C-O-A-L, is that he's fully exposed as a black man. He looks like Obama as a superhero. And yet, when the movie comes out next year, you're going to get the fully masked Black Panther. Now, it is ironic that a poster like this both shows his exposed black face, as Kirby intended him to be, but he's going to be wearing that mask, which is a racist holdover, no different than the Ku Klux Klan hood. And yet, most black comic fans who have waited years for their superhero to make it to the screen unfortunately, it's still going to have a remnant of its racist past. Now, when this image appeared on the internet about six months ago, there was all this outrage from the right-wing white community that it was too militant like the Black Panthers themselves, with Huey uh, Newton shown here, one of the original leaders, um, with uh, Bobby Seale on the left here. Now, the Black Panther Party was created in October of 66, almost six months after that first issue of Black Panther hits the newsstands. Now, they claim that they got the Black Panther name from an Alabama voting rights organization from 1964 that created the Black Panther to offset a right-wing racist symbol of the white community that used the rooster there on the right. But that Alabama voting organization got it from and here's the button for the Black Panther Party, but they got the Black Panther from Clark Atlanta College University, whose sports team was known as the Black Panthers. Now they went from Clark Atlanta University, here's their more modern version of their logo, but they still call themselves the Panthers, not the Black Panthers. But I've gotta believe that this issue coming out six months before, and I'm sure those Black Panther guys were reading Marvel Comics, like everybody else was, and I've got to believe that they took the name The Black Panther from Jack Curry, but we will never know for sure. So later on in the run of Fantastic Four, Kirby delivers more creations that would become evergreens in the Marvel Universe. Him becomes the character of Warlock in the hands of the great Gil Kane in 1969, and then in the 1970s by the great Jim Starlin becomes one of Marvel's key characters. You look at Ego, the Living Planet, and Kirby's photo collage technique, one of the great Marvel characters. And then in 68, he probably delivers his last great work for Marvel, even though he stayed on for another two years. Nothing in 69 and 70, his last two years of Marvel, could compete or compares with anything he created in those early years. But in this last annual in 68, he gives us one of the last great villains, Annihilus. He still gives us some great art, some great Kirby collages here, some great full pages. It also gives us the birth of Franklin Richards. But his last great creation, the Silver Surfer, shown here in 1968. And by the way, this is a perfect illustration of what made Kirby's Marvel work so different from what was happening in DC at the time. Kirby's greatest work comes at you. If most comic artists thought of the comic book picture plane as a two-dimensional flat plane, like an XY axis, Kirby gave us the Z axis coming at you three-dimensionally. Great DC artists like Infantino, everything was on the XY axis. Nothing is coming at you. Whereas with Kirby, you do. Now, the final indignity of Marvel was that Stan Lee, when they decided to give the Silver Surfer his own title, gave the character to John Buscema, 
who is one of the great Marvel Comics artists that came in Kirby's way. And at the time, Buscema was doing some of his career best superhero work over the Avengers and co-creating the character The Vision shown there. And some of his issues of the, of the Silver Surfer in 1968 and 69 are well loved by many Marvel aficionados and there's still an ongoing debate which is the better Silver Surfer. The more leaner, trimmer John Buscema version, which Stanley used as a platform in the late 60s to talk about all the woes of the world. But a lot of people who were fans of Kirby's Silver Surfer did not like this kind of bemoaning our fate, weepy Silver Surfer. We like the Jack Kirby, the more muscular, the bulkier Silver Surfer. But it's really the Buscema version that kind of won out. When they finally made the movie in 08, it was really the leaner John Buscema version. When Joe Satriani did his record album uh, 10 or 20 years ago, that's the John Buscema version pretty much. Even Galactus got a record album. Look at this one, right? And that's based on one of his great Galactus images that you see here. So here's the final issue of the Silver Surfer in 1970. Just as Kirby is leaving Marvel, and Herb Trim, the Hulk artist, draws the cover because without knowing that Kirby was going to leave Marvel, Marvel was planning on handing the series over to Herb Trim. So they let Kirby draw the last issue and one of his last stories from Marvel Comics, and they let Herb Trim ink it as a way of kind of getting into the groove of the character. But this ended up, maybe for sales reasons, being the Silver Surfer's last issue. But it's mostly known for the final image that really is a kind of stand-in for Kirby himself and the anger he felt at Marvel Comics for not only having his creations being attributed to Stan Lee, but seeing all the merchandising and none of the money that was supposedly, according to a verbal commitment made by Martin Goodman, supposed to go to Marvel. Look at the, he got to do the Inhumans at the very end, but his very last panel is this very pregnant image of Black Bolt declaring war. And like I said, Kirby knew about war. In fact, one of his last epics at Thor was the Mangog epic. And why does this tie in with Kirby's war experiences? Well, Mangog is a conflation of the two biblical evil warrior gods, Gog and Magog. And according to apocryphal biblical stories, at the end of the age, you know, Ragnarok, or in this case Armageddon, in Judeo-Christian terms, you've got the armies of Gog and Magog are going to meet in the Holy Land and fight Armageddon. Now, what was Kirby thinking of when he creates the man Asgard from the universe? It came from his World War II experiences of a similar blitzkrieg by his man Gog, Adolf Hitler. So you can see that some of these ideas made it into that man Gog epic. And as man Gog sweeps across the universe destroying worlds, he literally creates entire legions of refugees that Kirby calls the Wanderers. Now the wandering Jews was a myth that existed for hundreds of years of the wandering Jew that witnessed Christ's crucifixion and has to go through the world never dying as a testimony to the supremacy of the Christian version of God over the Judaic version. And the wandering Jews then became known as the Jewish refugees following World War II who were let loose on the world and eventually most went to the new state of Israel. But Kirby got all these ideas in his Ragnarok story that was the conclusion of this man Gog epic. And if you look at one of his Tales of Agard stories, Aftermath, about the destruction and the end of the gods, which comes from Norse mythology, and then you look at this full page, splash page, which was the very first page of the new epics that Kirby would bring to DC Comics in the 1970s with four titles, the flagship one being the new gods. So here's Carmen Infantino, former artist of DC Comics, and now in the late 60s, the editor and publisher. And there he is with his old friend Jack Kirby. By the way, that's Mark Evanier, who is now Kirby's biographer and worked closely with Kirby. And it was a big feat to get Kirby to come over to DC Comics. 
In pop culture terms, it was like the Beatles breaking up when Kirby left Marvel. My brother was a Marvel Kirby fan, and it broke his heart when Kirby left Marvel, and he stopped reading comics and never returned. And he was the biggest Marvel Kirby devotee. I dedicate my book to him. But um, the point is, is that is the effect to the point where Infantino was creating house ads announcing Kirby coming to Marvel Comics. And here was the very first thing we saw. And what the? Jimmy Olsen? Now remember, this was a time where there was very little advanced comic book news. We didn't know what was happening. We just heard a rumor in the comic book letters pages that Kirby was coming to DC Comics. So here is an issue of Jimmy Olsen, drawn by the great DC Superman artist, Kurt Swan. And the very next issue, this is what we get. Now, what's interesting about Kirby's first appearance at DC is that's not Kirby's Superman. Look at the pencil drawing that emerged years later. That was supposed to be the original cover. Side by side, you can see the difference. DC at the time felt that readers would be not familiar with Kirby's Superman, and therefore they couldn't risk it, so they brought in lesser DC superhero artists like Al Plastino to draw figures like that. I, for one, find it horrible because when you look at great Kirby pencils of his Jimmy Olsen work and then you see them inked with new faces by Murphy Anderson, I mean, it's horrible and it's the desecration of a master's work. It pulls you right out of the story. Pencils and then Murphy Anderson. Now, I love Murphy Anderson. It has nothing to do with Murphy Anderson. He was just a soldier being told what to do. But no matter how great Kirby's concepts were in his DC work, whenever you saw Superman, it was drawn by Al Plastino. I mean, look at this incredible Kirby techno collage, but totally ruined by a Murphy Anderson face. Now, there are fans who think it's okay. Kirby was so great, the story is great, but I, for one, cannot even read these stories because I can't get over the fact that DC had the balls in a negative way to desecrate Kirby's work all under the Nuremberg defense of, well, our corporate masters told us what to do. Licensing said we can't have that image. I find it hard to believe that we knew about artists as kids. That's why we were reading comics. You know? What do you think? We were such idiots that we wouldn't know that these fakes were dirty, but that was the contempt and the disrespect that the very editors and publishers of DC Comics had for its own audience, that we were idiots who couldn't tell the difference. So no matter how great Kirby's Jimmy Olsen work was, like this photo collage, I cannot read that story because of just that one face on Superman's body there. And to me, it's a desecration of a master's work on the proportional equal to the tutus they painted on Michelangelo's Last Judgment after he died. And then, I don't know, 50 years later, they took him off. But can you imagine all of his naked bodies at one time were painted over with little tutus, they were called. But there was some great art in Jimmy Olsen when it wasn't being you know, totally compromised. Right? And Kirby used Jimmy Olsen to bring back some characters from the 1940s, like The Guardian. Here's a Kirby self-portrait in the DC work talking about how he's loving what he's doing and he's being able to bring back some of these great creations from his past. There's a picture of Kirby at about the time with his presentation piece for Orion of the New Gods, the flagship character shown there on the first cover and here on the splash page. And there is um, what was called New Genesis, the home of the gods, which again, you can pretty much see precedence for all of his new gods work in his Marvel work, because New Genesis was very much like Asgard, where the new gods were the good guys, frolicked and gambled. There were other characters like Light Ray, shown here in this pinup page, there was Metron, who was a kind of a quasi-hero villain. Anybody watching um, Supergirl? 
because uh, right now there's a Metron knockoff character. They don't call him Metron, he's the thinker or something, but he's basically Metron floating around in a high-tech Kirby chair, which Kirby again had done a villain called Modok over at Marvel Comics. Then Kirby does the Black Racer. Now this is either a laughable concept or some people think it's very cool, but he took a black superhero and put him on skis and called him the Black Racer. Of course, it's a knockoff of the Silver Surfer, right? Now, some people love the Black Racer and think it's cool. You know, I run a Kirby Facebook group. We still can't get a consensus on whether the Black Racer is cool. Then there's the Bug, one of the B characters in the New Gods. But recently, Michael Allred just started a new series with the Bug. So New Genesis was half of the other story in the New Gods, which was about the evil side of things, and that was the world of Apocalypse, which was Kirby's reworking of the word Apocalypse. And remember we told you about the Star Wars comparison? When you look at this version of Apocalypse, I mean, come on, is that not the Death Star? Of course it's the Death Star. And when you look at the main villain, the Doctor Doom of the New Gods, known as Dark Side, he's another offshoot of this guy, right? Although Kirby always claimed in interviews that his inspiration for Dark Side was this guy, Richard Nixon, who was the <laughs> villain of the 1960s to those of us who cared about life, liberty, and their pursuit of happiness. Don't get me started on Richard Nixon, but um, you look at all the Star Wars comparisons and, I mean, they're plentiful. First of all, you know, this is stuff you find, again, on the internet based on the classic Kirby FF character. You find stuff like this, where Dark Side is the father of Orion in the same way that Darth Vader is the father of um, Luke Skywalker. And then even Orion, when you take off his mask, he is actually the son and God has those evil qualities. But thanks to the Kirby creation, the mother box, he's able to restore his appearance to that of the good part of him. That's not evil. And this mother box that Kirby comes up with is a kind of all-in-one, everything machine. Well, what is that if not our iPhone of today? And then you have this guy representing the force. Well, Kirby has High Father representing the source, and he's got the hand that writes on the wall, right? The Unifriend. Well, the biblical story of the writing on the wall was the son of Nebuchadnezzar, who um, was a, a king over the Jews, and he basically, the Jews are in exile in Babylon, and all of a sudden, in the middle of everything, a mysterious hand writes on the wall that if he doesn't repent, and love God, he will be brought down that very evening this king dies because he doesn't repent and honor God. So that enters its way into Kirby's uh, Fourth World series, as it was called. Then you have villains like this from Star Wars, and you have Desaad in um, The New Gods. You have Steppenwolf, one of the Kirby villains, that's now going to be in the new Justice League movie in a completely different design, of course. But some of Kirby's greatest artwork and stories is found in the New Gods, in images like this, where you still got the classic Kirby tech and the kind of Thor medieval characters, stories like the Pact and double page spreads like this. It truly was Kirby Unleashed. And once he teamed up with the inker Mike Royer, who was more faithful to Kirby's pencils than even Joe Sinnott, you really got some of Kirby's greatest double-page spreads that were Kirby ideas that he just sort of left on the page and went on. I mean, whatever this character is and whatever he did to deserve this fate is worthy of an entire annual if Kirby chose to do it. Instead, all we're left with is this incredible image that has been used. Again, you find this stuff on the internet. This was some kind of record album. But Kirby was experimenting with this image for 20 years prior with images like this in his earlier Joe Simon ink style. Another great full page Kirby Tech kind of image, right? With power and energy, motion lines. Perhaps the single greatest Kirby DC New Gods image 
is the final page of one of his great stories, The Glory Boat, in which it literally is jumping off the page at you. Bruce Timm got to play around with some of Kirby's New God characters in his Justice League animation. Maybe Walt Simonson is one of the few artists that is able to channel Kirby without slavishly imitating him. And his version of Orion, done about a dozen years ago, is maybe the only readable quality version of Kirby's character. But DC continues to retread and retreat Kirby's characters. So in addition to the New Gods, you got these other books, Forever People. That was Kirby's kind of idea of hippies. You know, he moves to California in 1969 and is surrounded by young California hippies. And he ends up making them into the Forever People. And the same thing, they've got all this high-tech energy. There's Kirby at his pool in California working. He moved out there because his daughter had asthma and couldn't take the East Coast. But there's Kirby's forever people, you know, inked by Vince Scaletta, boo, we don't like him, but we'll talk about that later. And like I said, taken right from the culture of the day with the hippies. And some of Kirby's great art was in the forever people as well. Some of his greatest art was outside of the pages of forever people in these posters and promotion pieces that he would do later. The third book, Mr. Miracle, the super escape artist, his original presentation piece that Kirby did in 1966 when he was at Marvel, secretly behind Stan Lee and Martin Goodman's back. He got Don Heck to ink it and color it. And you can see that his early color schemes were just a miracle. I mean, I call that drab green and piss yellow, sorry. And then in the first issue, he's experimenting with purple and green and yellow before he re kind of resolved it into the red and yellow that we know of Mr. Miracle. Now, he based Mr. Miracle, actually, on Jim Steranko, who shown here in 1970, but in his earlier days, 10 years prior, was actually an escape artist. And once he befriended Steranko in the late 60s, Steranko ended up kind of being influenced by him to do Mr. Miracle. And just like in the other Fourth World books, there's some really incredible artwork in Mr. Miracle. You've got the introduction of one of his great female characters, Big Barda. Now, you gotta be a really good artist to draw a big woman and still make her kind of sexy versus a big, ugly woman. But Kirby based Big Barda on the singer and entertainer, Lainey Kazan, who is definitely a plus-size model, to put it nicely. And there's the last issue of Mr. Miracle in 1973. It was the longest running of the fourth world titles. Infantino and DC canceled the whole line in 1972 after only a year and a half, claiming low sales. Yeah, oh no, not him. That, that him was not Dark Side, it was Infantino. And I'll never forget, I asked Infantino before he passed away when I interviewed him, tell me how much money the Kirby books were losing that you felt you had to cancel the King of Comics magnum opus. Now I was expecting him to tell me thousands of dollars a month. Now remember, this is $1972. He tells me each of the four books was losing $500 a month. Now, after I pulled my jaw off the floor, even in $1972, I told Infantino, Carmine, there were fans who would have paid DC 500 a month to keep those books going. So it tells me, with my conspiracy mind, that I believe, and I'm probably the only one who believes this, I believe DC brought Kirby in intentionally to fail. I believe they wanted to punish him for beating them single-handedly in the 60s. And if you don't think corporations can act, you know, venously like they did, then you don't know the history of American corporations because they can and they have. And I believe they were willing to accept a certain amount of financial loss in order to punish Kirby. And I believe that Kirby was never the same after that. I'll show you some of his later fourth, uh, works after the fourth world, with the exception of some asterisks here and there. I believe Kirby's, they succeeded. I believe Kirby's soul and heart was decapitated along with the fourth world. And the last 22 years of his life was a slow decline. And I put that blame all on DC and Infantino for literally decapitating a master in his prime on his magnum opus. So DC has done Mr. Miracle and all the fourth world characters after Kirby. 
This is the great Marshall Rogers, who, you know, dearly beloved of Departed. In the 90s, they did another version of Mr. Miracle. This is in the aughts, as we call them. Lately, there's been a new version of Mr. Miracle that's getting all the rage now. Everybody's talking about how great this new version is. I bought the first couple of issues. I haven't read them yet. But look at this thing I found on the internet, this picture, very rare, of Kirby and Infantino together. And Gary Groth, the editor of the Comics Journal, very respected trade history magazine. And look at what Kirby answers. The most creatively rewarding period was when he had to think about it. For a year and a half, he gets to do what he wants to after years and years in the trenches, giving his creations to other people, only to have them prematurely discontinued. So Kirby at DC in the early 70s, he's trying everything, different formats, different concepts. This house ad appears. And we're like, again, as fans, we're like, what the hell is this? Kirby doing a thing about gangsters? Well, that's because a year before, the novel, The Godfather, was a big success. So all of a sudden, this bizarre magazine size issue appears in like 1971, I think. And we didn't know what to make of it. It wasn't really a comic book, it wasn't a magazine. The stories inside were in this weird blue duotone, inked by Coletta, which we already didn't like, but the blue duotone didn't help. But, you know, they were Kirby crime stories, because remember, the guy could draw any genre. Then this magazine comes out, Spirit World, which is a combination of Neil Adams and Kirby and those bizarre eyes. I don't know who did those. But also stories of the spirit world with Kirby, Mysterioso, Harvard, but again, with a horrible blue duotone. But again, this was very much like one of the genres that he created with Joe Simon, Black Magic Comics. So Kirby loved black magic and mysteriousness. So after the fourth world gets discontinued, he comes up with his next creation for DC. He does the demon. There's the first issue in 1972. Now, where does he get the demon from? You gotta go back to Prince Valiant, that him and his entire generation would drool over pages like this. Anyway, this one sequence, Prince Valiant gets a chicken skin and disguises himself as this character, and I mean, come on, that's basically the demon. So while the demon had some great artwork and it fans the demon think the story lasted about 18 issues, but this is the beginning of Kirby's, what I call his derivative works of his post fourth world career, where there might have been some great stuff, but in the end, to me, it just felt derivative. But a lot of people love the demon, Bruce Tim among them. Whenever he has a chance, he gets the demon in there. And there is Kirby drawing another one of his post-Fourth World characters, reading the issue of the demon, and that happens to be Commandy, the last boy on Earth. Now, another derivative work, because when you look at this in the splash page, what do you think of when you see that image? As beautifully drawn by Kirby, that's the final image of the Great Planet of the Apes from 1966, which Rod Serling wrote the screenplay of, but Rod Serling was a reader of pulp novels and science fiction, so you can find the giant Statue of Liberty as a remnant of Earth, you know, many precedents. But if you came of age with Commandly in the early 70s and you love the whole world Kirby created, then this is your great Kirby period. I happen to find a little too derivative, you know, all of the, mon all of the animals were like human, just like Planet of the Apes. But there was some incredible artwork, again, by Mike Royer, who many believe is Kirby's faithful anchor. And Commandy has become an evergreen property, just like all the Kirby properties, that DC continues to recycle over and over again. OMAC, kind of a very original creation, one of the bright spots in Kirby's post-Fourth World work with this weird, bizarre cover, which a lot of people still think is one of the strangest images he ever created, right? It's both sexy and repulsive at the same time, right? And here's his concept sketch for um, OMAC, who was supposed to be the one-man Army Corps, and he was kind of like a Captain America of the future, biogenetically created to be kind of a super soldier. And just like his other books, there was some incredible artwork at Kirby Tech in OMAC, similar to a character he would create five years later, Silver Star, 
Then while still at DC, he did The Sandman. And this issue sold incredibly well for some reason. And it was a modern version of the Sandman character he had done 20 years early. Once again, everything Kirby's doing at this point is somewhat derivative of either his own work or other people's work. One of the last issues of the Sandman, they got Wally Wood, the great inker, to come back and ink Kirby, but the magic was gone by that time, you know? He tries another one of his 40s characters in DC in 1975, right before he leaves them again, basing it on Manhunter, another character, very Sandman-like from the early 40s. Then he does a World War II book for DC called The Losers, and he bases the stories on his own experiences in World War II when he fought for General Patton. So when you see incredible images like this of civilians being massacred, not only does this resonate with what Kirby probably witnessed in his own experiences in World War II, but in the history of art, this is Kirby's version of the famous Goya um, painting, um, whatever it's called, March 8th, 1803 or something like that. So Kirby's done at DC in 1975, and he goes back to Marvel and goes back to some of his characters that he had had his glory days on a decade earlier. Well, we're still, you know, the jury's still out on this version of Captain America. He inaugurates it, he gets to write and edit and draw, and, you know, he does this whole thing about the mad bomb that makes Americans kind of crazy. Some of the art's good, but, you know, later Kirby starts to get a little wonky. But it's 1975, so he comes back to Marvel in 1976 in the Bicentennial, and he produces one of these treasury-sized comic book stories that has some pretty great artwork in it. And one of these is a double-page spread panel that very much resembles what's called the Psychorama at Gettysburg, which is a circular painting that goes around a room 26 feet long of the Battle of Gettysburg. And you can kind of sense Kirby's paying some kind of homage to that, but when you strip it down to its black and white pencil form, an artist friend of mine, Adriano Morace, looked at this, and he goes, Arlen, that reminds me of Guernica. And I said, you know, it does have a little bit of that feel. So I did an 11-page verbal visual essay on the relationship between fine art and comic book art, and this is a double-page spread, and in it, I show the relationship between the Goya image and Kirby's image, between Picasso and his Captain America image. And what I do here is I use a quote of Kirby describing this image, but I put it underneath Guernica. And when you read this, it actually makes sense for what Guernica is. And then here's a quote of Picasso talking about Guernica, and I put it under the Kirby image. And I do the same thing with the Goya and the Kirby image to get across my point that Kirby's art, again, is not, be fine art is not better than comics, but that the great comic artists like Jack Kirby have used the same themes. He returns to the Black Panther for a couple of issues, or I don't know how many issues he did, 15, 20, and it's got some, again, some, Kirby was still artistically in the mid 70s, not so far past his peak. He does a Silver Surfer graphic novel which teams him again with Stan Lee and Inker Joe Sinnott. The problem is that's the cover that they had the paperback of uh, the magazine painter Earl Norm paint. I happen to think it's one of the most horrible images ever created, and the type itself, that Mark, you're a graphic designer. Is that nice, some of the worst 1970s typography ever? But they thought at the time this was sophisticated type because they didn't want a graphic novel that looked like a comic book. They thought a graphic novel should look like a magazine or a book. Well, sorry, but that's horrible. You open it up, there's some you know, nice Kirby art inside. This image of Silver Surfer being released literally out of Galactus's hand, I ended up using in my introduction, in the beginning of my presentation. And there was some good Kirby art. Kirby introduces a female, a love interest, and there's Galactus. It was okay, but again, you read it and you just sense the magic is gone. It's just not there anymore, and everything's slightly uninspired. One of the best things he did at Marvel in the late 70s was The Eternals, which, here's the first, that's the house ad and the first issue. And The Eternals are very much like Kirby doing the New Gods again. Here's a spread of The Eternals 
and very much like the new God spread I showed you earlier. But it was Kirby once again being a little derivative and being inspired by then all the, this is before Ancient Aliens, this is Chariot of the Gods by Eric Von Danigan, a big hit in the mid 70s, all about how did ancient aliens you know, visit us that we call gods. So there's Kirby in 1976 doing the Eternals. And you can see in this double page spread, this image of this ancient astronaut god, you can't believe that once again, a filmmaker like Ridley Scott, five years later, when he does Aliens, uh, not five years, what did I say? Uh, how many years later? 70, not that many years? Uh, when he does Aliens 79. Yeah. So this is only three years after this image from the Eternals. But you can't deny the similarity there. And it's all on credit, of course. But The Eternals is probably the most loved of Kirby's late Marvel period work because it features some incredible Kirby tech like that. And of course, there were Celestials, these faceless godlike beings that Marvel is still continuing to milk. This is a recent series written by the great Neil Gaiman. And you can see Kirby's creations are finally wending their way into the Marvel Cinematic Universe because in the first Guardians of the Galaxy, or maybe this is the second one, I don't know, um, you can see that there's one of Kirby's Celestials. Then Kirby turns himself from kind of knocking off one of the great paperback um, successes of the 70s to knocking off one of the great TV shows of the 60s when he does, in the late 70s, for whatever reason, a comic book version of The Prisoner. Now, it's recently going to be finally published and inked by Mike Royer. But once again, if you've seen the TV show The Prisoner, it was brilliant. Why would an artist like Kirby do his version of something that was already brilliant? It kind of felt not only derivative, but we love Kirby, but it kind of like broke my heart to see him really wasting his time on doing an adaptation of an already brilliant work. But in his landscapes, like you see here, you saw the same things, not only from growing up on the Lower East Side, but look at this graphic design of this futuristic city. So Kirby, in designs like this, showed both ancient influences, world, you know, they talk about world music. Kirby's art is truly a world art because you can see elements of all different cultures in a cityscape like this. This was one of the cityscapes Kirby created to work in the late 70s on a movie adaptation of a famous science fiction novel by Roger Zelazny called The Lord of Light. And some of Kirby's designs are really spectacular, and you can see them here. So the movie didn't work out, so then they decided to take these designs and come up with a science fiction theme park that they called Science City. This is an actual article from 1979 or 78, and here's Kirby's design for Science Fiction City based on all those designs for the movie of Lord of Light. Now Kirby, for years, look at this Thor double-page spread, was always doing space cities, so it wasn't that much of a leap for him to go from here to um, those designs for Lord of Light. And once again, the Royal Chambers of Brahma, it's Kirby incorporating world architecture and motifs into these designs for Lord of Light. Heavy Metal Magazine recently reprinted them all in bright psychedelic colors. Well, eventually these designs, which were laying in limbo, were used to be this fake movie that the CIA used in Iran in 1979 to help get the hostages out because they needed designs of what would look like a movie and the CIA guy happened to know the movie guy that Kirby had worked with on Lord of Light. And that's why when Ben Affleck makes Argo, it was all about Kirby's work. And yet, for whatever reason, we don't know for sure, Kirby's work doesn't wind up in the movie. They have knockoff artwork. I've heard that it's because the Kirby people wanted money. They didn't want to pay. Who knows why? But it's a shame that a movie wins an Academy Award based on Kirby's actual artwork that saved lives. And instead of Kirby jumping on the bandwagon of an Oscar-winning film and getting notoriety, 
nobody really knows that saw this movie that doesn't know who Jack Kirby was, does not know that that was supposed to be Jack Kirby's thing. So he does another movie-inspired work when he takes Disney's Black Hole in the late 70s and again does a derivative work. And then the ultimate derivative work, even beyond The Greatness of the Prisoner, is Kirby decides to take the movie 2001, the greatest movie ever made, and do a treasury size big version of it. There's a double page spread wraparound cover. And yes, it had some great spectacular artwork. But 2001 is the greatest movie ever made. Why, Jack? I don't think it's ever been explained whether he was just hired to do it, whether Marvel gave it, whether he just, whatever reason, why would Kirby give us this scene when we could just watch the movie and get the actual scene? Okay, you got the monolith in the movie, Kirby does a more graphic comic book monolith. He's got the same astronaut like David Bowman in space getting all psychedelicized. Yeah, there's some, like I said, interesting Kirby artwork in 2001, very psychedelic, trying to approximate the light show at the end of the film. Then it spins off into a monthly comic for some reason. I guess the Treasury edition was successful. And you've got some real abstract art like this of some of Kirby's greatest Kirby tech. But on the side, he was doing portfolio pieces that merged God and man and God and machine and man and machine into pieces like this for these portfolios. But you can see the seeds of these images were in Galactus and his other images. But he starts putting out these portfolios around 1970 called The Gods, which were kind of knockoffs or spinoffs of what he had been doing in Thor and The New Gods. So you've got very 1930s, you know, WPA type images of these bulky, godlike, very Russian constructivist kind of, you know, revolution kind of images. Here's an interesting portfolio of The Gods with his idea of Jacob, the, uh, the Jacob fighting the angel coming out of the Bible, but Kirby, of course, does it in his high tech. There's a kind of Eternals, you know, with the angel as this kind of high tech alien. Here's Kirby's idea of God. I mean, that's other than the Kirby bulky knee, maybe the most extreme version of the Kirby knee. But there's God's bearded head up there. And in this image, very telling, it's Kirby giving us the state of the world as he sees it. God looking on somewhat dispassionately. And the world is just this ball of disease and gore and horror and war. Look at God in this panel actually turning his back on the human race, which is angry at him for turning his back. But that's Kirby's worldview, very different from the Michelangelo worldview that you see I parallel in that great Kirby self-portrait. Now, in Vanity Fair magazine a couple of years ago, was asked to name its greatest living artists. All the artists who voted wrote in what I call the usual suspects. Of course, there's not any comic artists on that list. There's no Jack Kirby on that list, but he's been honored by the Fine Art Museum world. In 06, the California Museum of Contemporary Arts had a major exhibition on comics where they got to use Kirby as the kind of logo image. Charles Hatfield, a Kirby scholar, out in California, up in, uh, where is he, uh, Northridge or something like that, did a major exhibit two years ago, one of the most beautiful comic art exhibits I've ever seen because it gives Kirby images the scale that they deserve. And here is the cover of the catalog that Hatfield put together. I wish I had gone to this exhibit because it really looks beautiful. I love the idea of giant blow-ups of comic book art much more than actually hanging the original art. I would do a whole exhibit of just giant blow-ups versus the original art. The original art's beautiful, but to me it doesn't get across the impact that comic art, when you blow it up big, really has. There have been off-Broadway plays about Kirby, most prominently King Kirby. Um, this is one of the posters for it. I saw it in Brooklyn a couple years ago, pretty brilliant. If it comes to your town or area, try to see it. Hopefully, with everything that's happening now, it might get a bigger production uh, that everybody will be able to see. 
IDW has been printing these giant uh, original art facsimile editions that are gorgeous. I mean, I don't even buy monthly color comics anymore because my comic budget goes to these $150 books. But I'm telling you, you have to fasten a drill cup to your chin when you look at these books because they're gorgeous. You open up one of these books and you're hit with end papers that look like this. Now, Art in America recently had a major story about Kirby showing you that the art world, the fine art world, has finally come around to treating Kirby as not just a great American comic artist, but as a great American artist. Now, I would have mocked up the cover to look like that. But what did the actual cover of that issue look like? This. So they still are reticent about putting a comic book <laughs> character on the cover. Now, I'm only showing you this cover of New York Magazine, not for anything to do with Jeff Koons, but just because I needed a cover of New York to tell you what I'm about to tell you, that a major writer for New York Magazine, who I'm Facebook friends with, younger guy in his 30s, Abraham Reisman, big Kirby fan, understands the whole Stan Lee problem. He's writing a major article about Jack Kirby for this magazine. It'll come out sometime, I guess, next year. That might be the game changer, like in the history of art, many great essays by art critics have done. It will place Kirby as exactly what I said, the great American artist. And I was fortunate enough, because he knew me and the projects I've done with Kirby, to be interviewed by him for this article. Now, whatever I said to him in that hour and a half may end up in the article, may not. But boy, did I get to lay out in bullet points everything that I felt was most important that he should get in this article. And one of the major points was, you cannot let Stan Lee off the hook. He has committed what I call the art crime of the 20th century. Whether that makes in the article or not, we won't know. But one thing we do know is that the work of Jack Kirby will survive, and his name will survive, whether it's in outdoor murals painted by fans like this one in Italy, or whether it's creations that, of his that are now appearing in movies, whether it's cosplay that you find on the internet like this, <laughs> or whether it's the books that DC and Marvel are reprinting of Kirby's work that show us that Kirby's universes that he gave us will continue for a generation. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being patient and sticking it out for my centennial lecture on Jack Kirby. I run a Facebook group, Kirby and Company. If you go to my website, uh, you'll see that you can get my Silver Age book there. Um, if you don't want to get it from me now, I'm just trying to save you postage. I've done some major projects with Kirby. This was the brochure design I'll show you at my table for a recent lecture in New York City that kind of gathers many of my past Kirby projects.